Welcome to At Issue. I'm H. Wayne Wilson. Thank you, as always, for joining us for a conversation on current issues. This time we're going to Washington, D.C. and beyond because we're going to be talking about the debt ceiling, the farm bill, Ukraine, and many other issues affecting our nation. And we're very pleased to have with us the recently elected congressman representing the 17th District, Democrat Congressman Eric Sorensen. Congressman, thank you for being with us. Thank you for the invitation, H. It's good to be with you. The congressman has a very busy schedule, so he is in Washington, D.C., so we thank you for carving out a little bit of time to tape this. Uh, Let's start first, before we get into the issues, uh, you've been in Congress for a touch over four months now. Do you have a sense as to the difference you feel for what Congress is doing and what your expectations were of Congress prior to entering Congress? Yeah, I, th- I think, you know, the expectations um, were difficult um, going into this, um, you know, because I had questioned, um, you know, whether or not, you know, do, do people have to, um, you know, have this political background in order to succeed in Congress? Um, instead, um, looking back on it, I believe we need more people uh, that will come to Congress uh, with that background of service, understand what the value of service is. And, and for me, you know, I, um, uh, I worked for, um, you know, a TV station in Rockford in the Quad Cities for nearly 20 years. Um, and so uh, through the hard work of, of proving um, that the information that I could give to my community was, was fair and truthful and, and accurate, um, I earned the trust of the people. Uh, but now that I'm in Congress, I realize that some of the best um, members of Congress, they don't come with a political pedigree. They don't come to Congress with, um, with, with wealth. Um, they come with life experience. Um, to be able to serve in, in Congress uh, alongside a pediatrician um, who wants to help uh, you know, get more access to health care, um, to to work with um, teachers in Congress, um, we have a member of the freshman class who she and her husband own an auto mechanic facility in in Washington State, and now there's a meteorologist, somebody who who has spent um, their life trying to make sense of a complex issue such that um, that our communities understand their place. And yet, with that in mind. The, at least the public perception is, is that when you get to Congress, you fall, you're a Democrat, so you fall under the leadership of the Democrats and a Republican would fall under the leadership of, of McCarthy. And uh, so we see, at least on the major issues, we see this partisan divide. Has that, that how, how does that concern you? Mm-hmm. Um, well, the fact that our, our politics is getting more and more polarized these days, that concerns me greatly. Um, and, and I look back at my neighborhood and I look back at a lot and I think about um, the neighbors that live on my street. Uh, we come from different backgrounds. Um, you know, we have different politics. Um, you know, we know who's, who's had a, a Biden sign in their front yard or who had a Trump sign in their front yard. Um, but I'll tell you what, um, I know that in my, in my neighborhood, on my street, um, the Republicans that I know, you know, they, they had an Eric Sorensen sign in their front yard. Um, we need to get back to um, the politics of, of, of neighborhoods, talking about our values instead of talking about politics. And, and I will tell you that um, it, I am so grateful every day that I get to represent this district without having that intermediate step of being bombarded with politics. And here's a case example, is when I got to Congress to um, orientation last year, um, after I was elected, um, I chose to sit down uh, across the table from the people that I didn't recognize. Now, those turned out to be the Republicans that had just been elected. And when they found out that I had a background in meteorology, that 
I believe that, you know, when we talk about the climate crisis, then we have to talk about the science and how the science can, can, can uh, move us forward. Um, I created the friendships. Um, and I will call them friendships because, you know, on my iPhone, I, I get texts almost every day uh, from a new member of Congress on the other side of the aisle. Um, and so, you know, I think we need to make sure um, that we are solving the problems that way. And, and that may make me a little bit different than most. As Congressman, you mentioned climate change. Let's let's talk a little bit about that. Is there any discussion at all um, on Capitol Hill about doing something to reduce CO2 emissions, et cetera. And we may go to the, the, the pipeline situation. We have some CO2 pipelines that are coming through West Central Illinois, et cetera. What do you see happening there? Yeah, I've, I've met with um, uh, executives at, you know, companies like Ameren, um, how we can make sure that we are moving toward um, electric generation um, that isn't going to have an impact on our climate. Um, also, um, we've been having extensive conversations here on Capitol Hill concerning permitting reform, uh, such that we can, um, in, in a way to fast track um, the ability for us to build the electric power lines of the future. Um, I look back and I'm inspired by some of the things that, you know, that we've already done in the past. When you look at the interstate highway system, um, that was largely built in about 30 years. Um, when you look at the interstate pipeline uh, system that we have, that was built in 30 years. When you look at telephones and, and even rural electrification, um, these were all done in short order. Uh, we need to make sure that as we accelerate and in our response to climate, um, that it's going to have immediate uh, impact. And so that's why I'm working with those, you know, those union pipe fitters. Um, you know, I'm, you know I, I'm in the business of making sure that we're moving forward um, in a way that is going to have a positive impact um, on our kids. And, and our kids are going to determine uh, their, their success is going to be determined by how, how we act. Congressman, much of your district is rural, a lot of farmers in your district. So the farm bill, which is authorized every five years, expires September 30th. We need to renew it. It's been renewed 78 times since 1960, so this is not new turf. What are the issues surrounding the farm bill? And then before you answer, let me preface for the audience that the farm bill isn't just for farms. A good portion of it, in fact, a majority of it is SNAP program, the nutrition program. Uh, Republicans have suggested with regard to the SNAP program that the age for seeking employment be raised to 55 in order to qualify for this. And also that states are allowed to exempt those people from that, that 50, what is currently the 50 year age. What's your take on where the farm reauthorization bill is right now? Well, first, talking about um, SNAP, um, we need to talk about this in the terms of food security, uh, because that's what this is all about. And also understanding that as of today, 89% um, of SNAP benefits um, are gone after the third week. Okay, so it's not enough today. And so what concerns me um, is the fact that we are conflating um, the debt ceiling with the budget. Um, and I think these have to be two different um, discussions, uh, but we need to make sure that our families have food security and that those benefits remain and they're not slashed um, because those have real impact on, on real people. Um, and, and while that does have a big impact on the farm bill, um, I'm also focusing, you know, as I'm hearing from family farmers, we need to strengthen crop insurance. Um, as we're seeing more severe weather events that are happening more frequently, um, they're affecting our farmers. We need to make sure that we stand by them and that they're going to be resilient. And so crop insurance is so important for me, making sure that we're using science and innovation for smart agriculture is important. Um, make sure that we have sustainable farming practices um, in addition to um, protecting food security. You mentioned the debt ceiling. 
that seems to be top of the news right now. Uh, can you discuss a little further what the prospects are? We know that the president has uh, truncated his visit. He's not going to Indonesia. He will go to Japan, but he'll come back because of this issue. Um, could you elucidate a little bit more on why we're why why the Republicans and the Democrats are uh, not not cooperating? It appears it appears they're not cooperating, and and as you mentioned, they've tied the Republicans have tied the restrictions in the budget to raising the debt ceiling. Yeah, I mean, I. I am, maybe I'm an internal optimist here, um, but I think the discussions that are going on uh, between leadership and the Democratic Party, also the Republican Party and the president, um, are going to get us um, to an agreement. Um, but look, I, I think the bottom line here is defaulting on our national debt um, should never be an option. We have to put that clearly. Um, you know, look what the rest of the world is, is going to think. What, what, what are they going to think if we don't pay our bills? If, if we're willing to take money, but then say at the end, you know, I'm not going to pay that back. Um, you know, I, I'll tell you, I'm going to be honest with you. Uh, you know, I've got credit card debt. You know, I've, I've got that bill that comes due every month. And it's really hard to look at that number. Um, but you know what? I, I have to pay it um, because it's my obligation. And so we have an obligation to, to pay our debt. And especially looking back at the previous presidential administration that made all of these cuts, um, you know, to the tunes of billions, hundreds of billions of dollars and trillions of dollars that we're paying for today. Um, we've got to make sure that um, that our word is good. Um, and so uh, also understanding that for people back home, um, that defaulting on our debt um, will have immediate ramification. Um, it's it's making sure that we're doing what's right here in Washington, such that Social Security, those those that um, that get those Social Security payments, um, that they're required to live, that you continue to get those. Uh, making sure that our veterans are taken care of, um, because that's what's at issue here. It's Medicare. I mean, all of these things are are in play. Because the Republicans want to use this as a political leveraging tool, and it shouldn't be used that way. Uh, not only is it an economic issue for this nation, but it would harm the standing of the U.S. dollar globally, because already we know that China is trying to supplant the dollar as the global currency with the yuan. So uh, this is not just about the United States economy. Correct. I mean, it's it's where where will our place be um, on the world stage? You know, as we're coming out of a pandemic, um, where are we going to decide to be? Um, and so, I mean, we look at the the economic implications, you know, whether that's in Canton, Illinois or, or across the planet, um, you know, and, and the way that I think about this um, is the the people of our district play pay, uh, they, they place the uh, uh, a certain level of trust in, in me to be their congressperson, right? Um, and when we look at the rest of the world, um, the United States is the most trustworthy. Um, why? It's because we've shown our work. We've done the hard work um, and we, we pay our bills. And so we have to show the rest of the world that we're good for it. Let me turn to the question of the banking system. We've had several banks, regional banks, that failed. Uh, does, the, does Congress have any role in trying to secure a safe banking system beyond what the Federal Reserve all, already is responsible for? Right, and I'm glad that you asked that question because um, I had members of the Illinois banking institutions in my office here um, just in the past couple of days. Um, and I asked the question with what happened with Silicon Valley Bank, could that have happened here in Illinois? And luckily in the state of Illinois, we've got the safeguards in place 
um, that that couldn't happen. Uh, we have to look at SVB was a, a very unique situation uh, where it grew exponentially just in a matter of years. You know, it had, you know, $10 billion, went to 100, went to $150 billion, and there were no safeguards to say, hey, let's slow down, pump the brakes. Um, and so, you know, the bank failures that, as we have, um, you know, they're scary, sure. Um, but we need to make sure that, you know, all insured are good, um, you know, and, and realize that, you know, in the state of Illinois, we've got more banks than any other state. Um, and that these are going to be secure financial institutions uh, because we cannot afford uh, to have, you know, the, the confidence in, in our local banks go down because, you know, um, because they're the lifeblood of many of our small communities. And, um, and, you know, also understanding that, you know, we're not going to bail out bad banks, um, you know, and what happened with SVB did not cost the taxpayers of the district. And I'm pleased about that too. Just for clarification, Congressman, um, Illinois has more banks than any other state in the nation? That, that when I was having my meeting in here uh, just recently, um, that was what was conveyed to me. So uh, so I take them at their word. Uh, the Illinois bankers, they, they should know that, uh, that fact. Uh, I wanna turn to the border crisis down in Mexico. Uh, Title 42 expired. That was uh, instituted during the pandemic under the Trump administration. And there was concern that when May 11th arrived that Title 42 would expire and that there would be a sudden rush. Thus far, it doesn't appear that there's a sudden rush. So question one is, what can you attribute that to? Question two is, there is a caravan of women with children, not necessarily men, women with children coming from Honduras, Guatemala. Uh, and then question three with regard to that is, uh, you have introduced a couple of amendments, a Border Patrol one to add more Border Patrol and the fentanyl bill, uh, amendment. Uh, so could you give us an overview of the, the border crisis? Right, um, you know, and, and it, it is a border crisis. We need to make sure that our border is secure. Um, you know, when we look at, again, how this situation was being uh, made po and, and politicized over the past few weeks, um, you know, so many residents, you know, you, you, you'd turn on Fox News Channel and it would be that we were going to be inundated, uh, you know, by, by refugees. Um, and that never happened. That was an inaccurate forecast because they didn't have good data. Um, and so it's understanding that we have a problem at the border. How do we solve that problem? And right now the extremists on the other side, they don't wanna solve this problem because they realize it's really good for them politically to, to run campaigns on. Um, you know, And for me, my perspective is when we talk about immigration, we are talking about people here. Um, this is not a political football. Uh, we can't play politics with what's going on there. And that's why I did introduce that amendment that would have added 500 Customs and Border Protection officers at ports of entry along the southern border. Why? Because the problem here is we have too many people. How, how do we deal with too many people to figure out who is coming and going? We need to make sure that there's a proper way, much like when we go to a grocery store, you know, instead of waiting, you know, for for 15 minutes because the lanes aren't open, I want to open the lanes. OK, I, I want to make sure that, you know, as people um, are, are coming to our border to seek refuge, um, that they can be processed. Um, I wanted to uh, I introduced an amendment that would have spent 50 million dollars to expand um, a task force to go uh, after fentanyl. Uh, we understand that, you know, fentanyl is coming across our border at the legal points, okay? They're coming in uh, containers. They're being smuggled in at the legal points, right? We need to understand that that's the problem. That's the source of the problem. So we have to fund that problem. This isn't about building a wall somewhere. That's not going to solve the problem. But, but in the end, the Republicans refuse to hear any of these amendments. And, and that's what's telling to me here in Washington um, is that 
There are some folks here that would rather get on television on a national news program and talk all about how uh, the Democrats aren't willing to solve the problem. Well, um, I can tell you succinctly through the data here um, that we want to solve the problem. We're willing to do the hard work, but it's just not getting through this Republican controlled Congress. So to be clear, the two amendments, fentanyl and Border Patrol, have not progressed at this point. Right, they're, they're still in limbo. The Republicans didn't want to hear it. They would just rather have a straight up vote because they've got the majority. They'd just rather have that and then have it be sent to the Senate where it's going to be dead on arrival. Whereas what I would like to see is bipartisanship where we work together to make sure that the bill is, is good. And then what I will do is go lobby our senators to say, here's why I believe that we should focus and support this bill. Um, that's the bipartisanship that I ran on, and that's the bipartisanship that I believe is going to make me uh, um, the best congressman for our district. Let's go overseas, Congressman, uh, to the question of Ukraine. Uh, the United States has been a leader in supplying uh, both humanitarian and military aid to Ukraine during the, uh, uh, the invasion by Russia. Uh, European nations have also... Uh, given the same, uh, not in the same level, but the same types of materials. Mm -hmm. are, are we doing enough? And what might happen if we don't do more? Right. Um, and, and that, I think, is the, is the million dollar uh, question. Um, but we have to understand um, that what we saw with, with Putin's aggression um, was the attack on a sovereign democracy. And there, it, it's disheartening, it's distasteful to me um, now that we've got members here on Congress um, that are not willing to support Ukraine anymore. Uh, because I look at what are the ramifications if we didn't support a democracy um, and Ukraine um, it, and let Putin um, invade a, a, a sovereign nation. Um, it would say to the rest of the world, again, um, that the United States isn't good for it. The United States isn't going to stand up for that. And, and then I look at what, what does that mean for China and Taiwan, um, and also an independent sovereign nation, right? Uh, what does that mean for Iran and Israel? Um, what does that mean for our own democracy? Um, we have to make sure. Um, that we stand steadfast uh, with Ukraine um, against this illegal occupation of their land. Um, and we have to support all critical democracies around the world because sh surely on, on January 6th, that memory is not going to go away at how close our democracy was to failing itself. In the couple of minutes we have left, could you... Uh... Could you suggest what might pass in Congress with regard to guns? Is there anything that might, a, a universal background check or uh, the AR-15 style weapons? Is there any discussion on those issues at all in Congress right now? The hardest thing that I have to deal with every day is, is understanding um, that there will be um, more mass shootings before Congress solves this problem. The, the hardest part for me, H, is um, I don't know there's, if this is going to happen in Peoria or Canton or Galesburg or, or Normal or Bloomington. Um, and, and that weighs on me um, because Congress is clearly not doing enough. Um, they're not doing enough. We are not doing enough. Um, to, to find ways to reduce gun violence. How on earth is it today that I need a fingerprint to open up my iPhone, but a gun on the street doesn't need a fingerprint of its owner in order to shoot? What would that mean if a kid couldn't pick up a gun and fire it? Why, why can't we utilize um, technology so that each round has a serial number on the inside so that ballistics can find out who shot the firearm and committed crime. And then finally, I will say, why in God's green earth 
Um, do we need weapons of war on our streets? Um, we need to do more. Um, and, and unfortunately, this should drive people um, to understand who they need to support, who they need to vote for, um, because we need to make sure that, um, that the people get to Congress so that if it doesn't happen here in the 118th Congress, in the 119th Congress, we can get the job done. Congressman, thank you so much. There's so many other issues we need to discuss, but we appreciate your spending the last half hour with us and uh, we'll allow you to get back to the business of governing. Thank you for being with us on that issue. Thank you, H. And thank you, viewers, for being with us on that issue. Next time, we're going to take a look at something called Choose Greater Peoria. It's an effort to attract top executives to central Illinois. We'll have that conversation next time on At Issue.